The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? So tonight on Where Did The Road Go? We have a very special guest. His name is Edmund of Marriage. And uh, this is the first of many parts of an interview I plan on doing with him. He is the head of something called the Golden Age Project and uh, has a lot of very interesting information about our distant past. Now, I have to warn you going in, some of it might be a little uh, controversial. His views on Jesus, his views on climate change, on Zachariah Sitchton. Uh, so just forewarning, it might be a little more controversial than normal. I am... I think his stuff is fantastic. Uh, he has a video series up called Learning from History that you can watch on YouTube that is almost mesmerizing in its information. So I highly recommend checking those out as well. And we will have Edmund back sometime very, very soon to continue this conversation. This was recorded a couple of weeks ago. And again, go to our YouTube where you can find all kinds of stuff uh, video-wise, and we'll be adding more and more constantly at this point, and hopefully that'll keep up. Uh, throw us do a donation if you like the show. Check out the website. There's book reviews, there's blogs, there's, uh, there's all kinds of stuff. There's even a movie we made in the video section. And you can always find everything at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. With no further ado, here's my conversation with Edmund Marriage. <laughs> So tonight we're talking with Mr. Edmund Marriage, and you're based in the UK, aren't you, Edmund? That's right, in, in Herefordshire. Okay, now, do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'm, I come from a, um, a, a, a family which was involved far, mostly farming and, um, and millers, uh, flour millers and farming, um, and I, um, my father was a farmer. Um, and I trained in agriculture and land agency uh, at um, the Royal Agricultural College, Sirencester, and um, eventually for a year, postgraduate year, at Y College, London University. So I had six years of um, academic training, which was mixed with a lot of practical training as well. So I had a very good balance of academic and practical work. I had my first flock of sheep at the age of 17, and I was given my first farm to manage by one of the big um, land management companies in oh. 1961, uh, managing a 680-acre farm uh, in Lincolnshire when I was 21. Uh, and so I was dropped in at the deep end in terms of taking on a farm and having to make it work. Okay. And how did you get interested in ancient civilizations and the like? Well, I've always, um, in my farming career, I was always interested in finding post holes or the remains of post holes um, and human occupation before uh, or in, in, in ancient times. And um, I, uh, later on in my life, I moved to Gloucestershire on the Cotswold Escarpment, where we had a very large number of long barrows. And I moved to a house which was called the Lee Sows. And Lee means a field, and Sows meant which, which it was sowed. It was cleared and sown. And these were terraces in the Cotswolds um, along a valley on the Frome Valley um, with a high percentage of long barrows. Um, and I had a 30-acre area of land with the house. Uh, and I was very interested because I could literally see the sights of three long barrows from the house where I was living. And I rang the British Museum and talked to their expert on long barrows. And he said, oh, yes, those long barrows are the oldest in Britain. They're about 4,200 B.C. Nice. And it became very clear that we had a complete farming package, farming uh, system of growing crops and having sheep and cattle. Um, at that point of 4,200, which proved to be the migration 
of peoples into the British Isles from the Near East. So we have major settlements at side fields on the west coast of Ireland, which was very well organized, uh, large rectangular shaped fields, uh, complete central organization and a brilliant layout. And then that was covered by about five feet of peat in succeeding years when the, mm. when the climate changed, because 4,200 was what we call the Holocene optimum, the warmest period over the last 10,000 years. And so the, the, um, uh, the arrival of people into the United Kingdom at that time is very important. We actually had wheat, barley, and even maize growing on Dartmoor in southern England at the same date, uh, along with um, the mining uh, of copper and tin. So um, we have a fantastic history in this country, but it was this migration of these populations of people who came from the Near East to settle in Britain, which had a wonderful temperate climate, and where they were able to bring their farming systems, which have been developed um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Wow. Well, I guess that would definitely make you interested, finding that you have those on your property like that. Well, the, the long barrows were, you know, were the, they were always positioned so that they were well-drained, well drained, normally uh, sited east-west, um, and they were constructions which were not tombs and, or temples. <laughs> they were places for people to go to take cover from what had been happening, which was the sky falling cometary debris, debris come in and go, coming in and going bang. And we know there's been a cyclical procession of this kind of cometary activity um, throughout human history. And there have been very bad patches. The great catastrophe was 8, 10, sorry, 10,850 when the world was tipped on its axis and much of the geology of America was formed by water sloshing across when the oceans literally overflowed. And so the concept of digging a pit or a hole and hiding was something that our ancestors had to do and build into their farming systems so they could take their cattle and themselves into those structures um, in order to be able to survive during the bad times. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Uh, I already have about a million questions for you. Um, but let's, let's start with what we were talking about when we started talking here tonight uh, before the interview with the fact that we're doing this just coming out of August. It's going to air, I think, in uh, later in September. But we're recording this coming out of August, and there was some stuff you wanted to talk about there. Yes. <clears throat> or, the name August uh, was a name of the Roman emperor who was first called Octavian. He was a nephew of, of Caesar, um, and he brought peace to the Roman Empire by um, probably mostly by brains and, 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 and a high level of force at that time. He had to fight Mark Antony, for example. But he was the man who set up what is called by historians Pax Romana, Roman peace. He made sure that everybody who was part of the Roman Empire was a citizen of Rome. So it doesn't matter what part of the Roman Empire it were, you were entitled to be called a citizen of Rome. And he called himself the first citizen. When Caesar had come to Britain, it was really to sort out a feud and problems with the tribes in East Anglia who were spending more time fighting than they were growing wheat and corn and crops, etc. And it was these crops that the Romans needed so badly, particularly wheat, because their uh, grain basket, as we call it in North Africa, um, was uh, drying out yet again through climate change. Um, and climate change wasn't then being caused by uh, uh, CO2 emissions. It was um, a natural cyclical feature of life on this planet over a very long period of time, driven by the sun. But the Romans wanted all that Britain could produce. 
and we had a very successful farming industry and the Romans wanted to trade with us. They wanted to buy our grain and they brought us wine and so there was a tremendous trade with Rome and that was the principal purpose of the Romans moving through Gaul and into Britain. There were always difficult periods because Caesar had virtually wiped out the resistance from the Gauls and that may have meant killing a million people, which didn't go down very well in Gaul, and it caused real problems in Britain because Britain had been supporting the Gauls, their fellow Druids, um, with wonderful ships that sailed from the old Cardiff harbour down to the area of the Veneti on the uh, coast, of, south coast of Brittany. Um, and Britain supplied troops, arms, resources, food to back up the Gauls in their resistance to Rome. So there was always a difficult phase here with one group of politicians wanting to fight and another group of politicians wanting to make peace and trade and establish good laws. And this has been the history of the planet for the last 2,000 years and much longer <laughs> in fact. And with any luck the peacemakers win but Augustus was a man who set in place the measures for peace between nations, certainly peace between all those countries involved within the, what was called the Roman Empire. And uh, his, his successor, his, his, his wife's son, Tiberius Caesar, played a very important role in pacifying, if you like, or bringing peace to the Germanic tribes. And so you have in Rome um, a very important man, Augustus, um, putting in place a system of government and respect for people, which has almost been unequaled in the history of the planet. And the most interesting part about that was the links between the British royal family um, all the kings and royal families in Britain, their relationship to a man called Brutus, who was the, one of the great founders of Britain, along with Brutus's brother Aeneas, who was the founder of Rome. So the British kings all remembered that Brutus and Aeneas were brothers, and that Rome and Britain should be closely linked and have peaceful relationships. It was a point that came up time and time again when the Romans got nasty, so to speak, or behaved badly towards Britain in the following 300 years. Something, a point that we've lost today. Um, the royal family links didn't only just link the British royal families with Rome and the court of Augustus, they also linked the Herod's court in Judea. And history shows very clearly that these migrations of people from the eastern Mediterranean um, came from the area of the Lebanon, Judea, um, Syria, Sumeria, uh, Turkey. And so most of the people, or many of the people who came into Britain as farmers were people who originated in the Fertile Crescent or even as far as the Levantine Corridor which runs from the Dead Sea up to Damascus. So Herod uh, found that he got close relations in Britain um, and Rome and it was more like one big, or should have been, one big happy family. And that's what Augustus tried to exploit for peaceful purposes. And he did many good works for Rome, built wonderful buildings, and set an extremely good example. And one interesting feature here is this story of Jesus. Jesus is the most popular man on the planet. <laughs> he is a prophet of Islam and of the Muslims. There is a grave beside Muhammad for Jesus on his second coming. Mm. Um, the Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, 
you can go through every religious group, and of course there are many thousands of them, and we find a common denominator, and that was this extraordinary man, Jesus. And it was about Jesus' teaching, and about his attitudes, and his way of doing things. And what we find is that Jesus' mother, Mary, spent a lot of time at the court of Augustus in Rome. And we find that Jesus was in fact fathered by Tiberius Caesar. Now this must come, may come as a terrible shock to people, but it's extremely well documented. There have been many books on the subject. I'm certainly not the first person to raise this issue. I just think we should look at the evidence that's available, think globally, think of the crucial links and look at the history as it was at the time. Now what happened was that Jesus and his twin brother Thomas spent time in, in, in Alexandria in the Therapeutae um, Universities Colleges with the Essene, who were all, Dru it was all Druidic, uh, the oldest way of doing things, not a religion, the way of doing things. And Jesus spent quite a lot of his time, early years, up to the age of 12, with Augustus in Rome. And Augustus regarded Jesus as his favorite pupil because he was so bright. And the British king I mentioned before, Tavantius Tascovanus, had two boys, and he sent them to be educated under Augustus at Augustus's court. About 15 years earlier than Jesus and Thomas were there. And those two boys um, were, if you like, Romanized, brought into the system of peace and trade, and great respect between the tribes of East Anglia and Rome with Augustus. And those two boys went off to fight with Tiberius Caesar before he was emperor in Germanica and the two boys were killed, which left the most important king in Britain, um, Tavantius Tascovanus, without heirs. Mm. And Augustus and Tiberius Caesar, who was Jesus and Thomas's father, sent the two boys for adoption to Colchester in Essex for, so that Tavantius had an heir who was who understood, was friendly with, and could bring people together peacefully under Pax Romana and Augustus. So Jesus arrives at the age of 12 with his brother Thomas, and uh, uh, um, uh, to Tascovanus dies in AD 10, and Jesus takes over the throne. Um, uh, in the year before, he'd proved himself at the age of 16 in unifying two of the tribes who were still giving difficulty. But he was so highly regarded by the Druid Council at that time that they appointed Jesus King of Kings. This is where we get the King of Kings story. Mm. Now, a King of Kings was... Uh, he was, uh, Jesus was, was appointed the first Pendragon, which means King of Kings, of the Britannic Isle. In the ancient world, a King of Kings was called a Shishak. In uh, Saxon, it was eventually called a Bradwald. In Britain, it was called a Pendragon. In Greek, it was called Ozymandias. And so the system of kingship worked extremely well because people were selected as kings after having carried out a comprehensive training and education. In other words, they were very carefully selected for kingship because every community knew that they would be more successful under a good king than a bad king. And so it was the whole system of kingship lowered from heaven by the Anunnaki in the first instance. And we're going to come back to the Anunnaki and the Shining Ones and the Garden of Eden later on. So we have a situation where Jesus is um, known as the most successful king in Britain. 
a unified Britain. He's known in Wales as Seneflin. He, he was also known as Cymbeline. He was also known as Cuno Bellinius. And he did a brilliant job um, up to the time that Augustus and Tiberius Caesar clearly felt that he should go and try and bring peace to Judea. So Jesus was going to Judea, having been a mother, having been based in Judea and on the line of Moses. And Jesus went to Judea. He was a stranger in Judea when he arrived. And he played a, a major role in attempting to bring the extreme rebels, if you like to call it that way, particularly in Jerusalem, um, to bring them into a peaceful arrangement with Rome. Now, many parts of that area, that area you find Caesar, uh, Tiberius, you find Ashkelon, you find many of the towns. Tiberius was named after Tiberius, and many, most of the population in that area was relatively happy with the idea of being citizens of Rome and being part of Augustus's overall peaceful plan. And Jesus' mission was to bring peace. It wasn't to bring war. It was to persuade people to follow the old way of doing things, which was the Druid way of doing things. Christianity started in Britain uh, with Jesus in Britain, and um, the concept of Rome coming in in four, 640 over 600 years later and claiming that religion started in Rome um, is quite wrong. And this is where we have to go back to basics in understanding where our religion came from. Christianity, British Christianity, was a restatement of Druid beliefs and practices, the most important of which was the truth before the world. And when Pontius Pilate, who was also a Druid, tried Jesus, the first thing he said at each, each court appearance was, what is the truth? This is what was always said before a legal hearing. What is the truth? Crucial components of our history. And Tiberius was so impressed with his son that he nominated Jesus to be um, a, a given the title of a god. Um, that was only reserved for people like emperors who were regarded as gods. So when Jesus is described as the son of God, he was the son of Tiberius Caesar, who happened to be regarded as a god as most Roman emperors were. So we get these stories about king of kings, son of God, etc., etc., all come into the script based on misinterpretations and misunderstandings of history. And the problem with organized religion there are so many of them, they all evolved in different ways, but they missed the key points and the key message of Jesus' Druidic teachings, and that was all about peace. It was the um, equality of men and women. It was the truth before the world. Um, and um, the Sermon on the Mount, and you see such similarity between Jesus' teachings and his twin brother Thomas's teachings, you see all this so clearly on the Sermon of the Mount. Read the Sermon of the Mount. Look at what Jesus is actually teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. Standing there in a white, um, um, I, I'm not going to call it a dress, but it's a white, um, <laughs> uh, in fact it is a dress, but the point is that's classic Druid teaching on hmm. the Sermon of the Mount. And it's so important that we remove all the dreadful prejudices which we have attached to all the different religions which have sowed the seeds for the problems we have today, which I don't have to tell anybody how disastrous the situation is in the world today with killing uh, religions, killing each other political divisions and religious divisions destroying the planet well yeah and uh i'm sure a lot of people are, are hearing you talk about this and they're they're utterly puzzled why this is probably the first they've ever heard of this um where would you recommend people can find more information and uh dig a little deeper into this whole thing 
Well, I'm I'm in the process of putting documentation together. Um, they'll have to do what I did, which was use their own free will and mind to look at the evidence that's available. If they go on to the, they can now, thank God, go on to Google search and search this subject on Google. And so within a short space of time, maybe half a day or a day, you can begin to get a framework, a skeleton or a framework of the evidence that's been made available um, for the points that I've made in the last 20 minutes. So it's up to individuals to do their own exploration and not to take for gospel what they've been told in their <laughs> respective religion. It's all about um, far more practical things and we need to know, all of us as Christians, and I need you to know, well, what, where's this chap? What happened to this chap Jesus between the age of 12 and the time of the crucifixion? Right. Okay. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in about a minute with Edmund Marriage. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. All right, and tonight we're talking with Edmund Marriage, and uh, that was a nice controversial 20 minutes, I think you, you pretty much started with there. And uh, I find it utterly fascinating, and I, I, I know there are a few other books out there talking about some, some of that, but not, not to the extent you've laid out. Um, and let's, let's get into a little bit about who Christian O'Brien is and what he has to do with all of this. Well, Christian O'Brien made it, possible for me to be able to say what I've just said. Um, he, the last book he wrote during his lifetime was called The Path of Light. And The Path of the Light, Path of Light was his translation of the Askew and Bruce codices, which might have been described as Gnostic, but they weren't. They were original source documents of what Jesus was teaching to his inner circle of disciples which consisted of both men and women and these, these, these texts were written and witnessed by the disciple scribes Thomas, uh, Matthew and Philip uh, which is what happened to a legal document in those times so you've got three very important people recording it and witnessing what was said. Now this is the advanced knowledge uh, which was only given to the initiates, if you like, or the instructions of the people closest to Jesus so that they could go out and spread the message around the world. Um, and it was a restatement of what was taught in the ancient mystery schools. If you remember, Confucius um, said that you should do unto others as, as uh, they would have them do unto you. Uh, it was summarized in reciprocacy. Uh, Jesus had the same message. It was a common message going back thousands of years to the original Garden of Eden site, the home of the um, sons of the god Anne, who were called the Ananage, the two Arthur Danan, the people of the god Anne, and the Druids were the successors of the two Arthur Danan. So it was a common thread of teaching about the transmigration of the soul. Now it's very complicated stuff because many people were only just beginning to understand other dimensions and uh, the way in which we are able to communicate in, a, uh, intelli in an intelligent and responsive universe. Um, 
and uh, it is an electric universe. We are electrical. Um, we run on electricity, and if people mess up our brain waves or put us under bright lights uh, and many other things, um, they can uh, literally mess up our brains and make us ill. Modern methods of, of curing illness are about balancing brain waves so the body can heal itself. So these are the spin-offs from this whole concept of understanding what Jesus was teaching in terms of the transmigration of the soul uh, from the path of light. And what's clear is that what Jesus was teaching was what is called Surat Shabad Yoga, Soul Word Union. And this is, gave me the evidence I needed to look at the British link, Jesus's British background and British link. Because we have seven disci 12 disciples coming back to Glastonbury and being given a hide of land, one hide of land. And Somerset, that's about 160 acres of land. Wow. The only people who were given a hide of land were qualified Druids. Jesus retired from kingship as an archdruid. And so the story goes on. We find he's also called Crestus, um, and he is in Rome in AD 49, alive and well. And the Council of Nicaea under uh, Constantine, who was a distant um, on the line of Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea, um, they, we have a, a situation um, whereby. Uh, the man called Crestus was Jesus. Jesus was still alive, and Christianity was founded on Christianity's chief protagonist, whose name was Crestus. Another link in this chain. So if we go back to Britain, look and see what was happening with the British Christianity, which is forbidden, you know, forbidden, almost forbidden to talk about it and forbidden to, to even suggest. Um, it's all regarded by our scholars at Oxford and Cambridge as everything that came before Constantine was pagan. That is outrageous. The word pagan simply means country people, a peasant, um, people who did not fall in line and comply with Roman Christianity. And we had a phase of Aryan Christians before the Roman Church finally gained control um, and the whole basis of the Roman Catholic Church is built on sand. Nothing solid there at all, which is a tragedy. And the sooner we all realize it, the better. If you look at Learning from History Part 12 on YouTube, you will see all the evidence to support the fact that Christianity started in Britain at AD 30, 35. Um, although, of course, that doesn't include Jesus' time. Um, but Jesus was um, simply a, the, best, the best king we ever had in the United Kingdom and brought the whole country together um, it, peacefully. And that was his major achievement. And he went on to try and do the same thing in Judea. He then left for uh, India. Um, and there's a lot of material on that uh, linked to Learning from History Part 12. Um, and just have a look. Draw your own conclusions. I don't want to preach to anybody. Just simply look and open your eyes to um, a more realistic version of events and build your own jigsaw puzzle and see how the pieces fit. From my own point of view, um, I'm quite satisfied to speak out on this subject because I feel that it makes so much more sense than what we've been taught conventionally. All right. Um, <clears throat> you also mentioned earlier the Anunnaki, which uh, most people know as the Anunnaki. You want to explain the, the difference there? Yes. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the problem we have with translating the Sumerian cuneiform is where you start. And the Anunnaki is a terminology used by Sitchin and some of the earlier translators of cuneiform. And um, it's not sound. Uh, it, it, uh, O'Brien came along 
and really worked at these ancient languages is the one person who realized that cuneiform, which is wedge-shaped lines on clay of the great civilizations in Mesopotamia, cuneiform had evolved from a very simple picture language, of which there were between 400 and 500 picture signs. And those picture signs were literally very clear. You could look at them and see a face. You could see a face with the mouth open, which meant speak. Uh, you could see water sign in front of the mouth, which meant drink. Uh, and so those picture signs were incredibly helpful uh, in terms of understanding what was being said at those ancient times. And this is the, literally the Indo-European people's pictorial texts. Um, you need to look at the um, references within the book called The Shining Ones to the Phaistos disc. And in the book called The Shining Ones, you'll be able to look at the big picture of O'Brien's uh, work. It took him 10 years to put that book together. But it gives the whole picture of, of the um, evolution of writing uh, from those very early picture signs. And the correct translation, um, which I would support O'Brien on, is that the word is Ananage, which meant, means the sons of An. And we have four key people, a man called An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninil. Ninil is a woman, and she becomes Ninkasag. And Ninkasag, or Ninhursag, was the governor of the Garden of Eden. She became called Ninhursag, or Ninkasag, when she was given the job of managing and running the Garden of Eden, which was the settlement below Mount Hermon, which was the origins of agriculture and civilization following the great Younger Dryas Ice Age, at the start of the Holocene, when the planet began to warm up quite rapidly after that great Younger Dryas Ice Age. And this is where we find all our early, earliest crops of wheat, barley, uh, something like 28 different species of domesticated crops in what is called the Levantine Corridor, the area between Damascus and the Dead Sea. Okay, all right. Um, now, The Shining Ones, uh, is was that Christopher O'Brien, Christian O'Brien's first book? No, he his first book, um, uh, he wrote, wrote several books. His first book, in fact, was a, a very detailed account of the geology of the Rocky Mountains. Oh. And when he first met my aunt um, and my, my, my godfather, who was B Barbara Joy O'Brien's father, um, he said, as he would do to a young man, he said, well, what do you do, young man? So Christian O'Brien said, I've been working out how far the Rocky Mountains have moved in the last 30 million years. <laughs> <laughs> well. And he had, and that was his, um, in fact, his second book. The first book was on um, uh, the, all the effects of salt in the geology of the area of Abadan, because that was a key book in terms of working out where the, uh, where the oil was. But mm. his, um, the first book was called Megalithic Odyssey, um, where he began to formulate his policy. Um, you can download on the Golden Age Project website um, his um, Wandlebury Hatfield Heath Loxodrome Treaty, uh, or I can send you hard copy if anybody wants it. And that was where he began, to, he, he, just, he found that the stone markers across the countryside um, in, between Essex and Cambridgeshire were exactly one megalithic mile apart, over 26 megalithic miles. And it was slightly curved to take into account the curvature of the earth. Hmm. To do that, the people who built it had to know the exact dimensions of the earth. So he proved beyond all reasonable doubt that in 2,500 B.C., the mathematicians and people in Britain at that time had calculated the exact dimensions of the Earth. And they'd also built on Bodmin Moor a fantastic um, um, observatory based on 
um, uh, well over a hundred stone cairns, uh, and that was where observational astronomy was taught by our Druid ancestors. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> was The Shining Ones then his, his major release, would you say? Well, the next book he wrote, um, the early work was done after he retired in 1971, uh, and he was formulating his work during the early 70s. And uh, the Megalithic Odyssey was the first book. The second book, and most important book, is The Genius of the Few, um, okay. which uh, is now sold out, I'm afraid, but it'll be republished next year. Um, but the, um, he, he needed to follow on from those books to trace the Shining Ones all around the world. And that's why the, the book called The Shining Ones is so important. The reason it's called The Shining Ones, it's maybe rather sensational to many people, but we use this word Elohim. In the St. James's Bible, in Christianity, the earliest name for God was Elohim. And then we found out that Elohim is in fact a plural word. And there's a footnote in the St. James's Bible making it clear that the Elohim is a plural word. It actually means the bright or shining ones. L E L means bright or shining, and the Elohim means the shining ones, plural. And we take that back also to another expression or word that's used. If you go into the Assyrian room in the British Museum and look at all the wonderful sculptures of people who look a bit like angels because they've got wings stuck on their backs. <laughs> um, they uh, were the Assyrian gods, and they are called the ab kar -lu. And ab kar -lu translates as the bright farmers from the enclosure. And all the images and pictures are, are holding goats, holding sheep, dealing with plants, um, totally agricultural. And everybody, right up to the time of Hadrian, knew exactly who the gods were and what they delivered, which was agriculture and civilization. That's why respects were paid to them. I don't use the word worship because worship's the wrong word. Worship evolves from workshop. Uh, temples evolves from tamen, or, uh, which is an administrative building. Uh, this, there wasn't even a word for religion in Egypt. The nearest word was heka, which meant mag man magic. So it's what religion has done to humanity in divorcing us from the realities of our past and the brilliant work of our benevolent ancestors who were the Ananage, sons of the god An. Now, they brought us civilization, I assume, from before the end of the last ice age. They must have been survivors. Um, from um, uh, they managed to get through the terrible catastrophe at uh, 10,850, which is well recorded by uh, in the word in the book called Cataclysm by Alan and Dallaire, um, by the cycle of cosmic catastrophe by Richard Farstone and his colleagues. Um, there are many more books now. I have a great big box in my office here from an American geologist, uh, his book given to me by Bernard Dallaire, um, which shows all the, the geology and features of the United States which were created by this uh, flooding of the United States by uh, massive levels of seawater, uh, ending up in the Lake Bonneville area where you have massive salt deposits. Um, so we need to look at the geology of the earth and to see how dramatic that catastrophe was because it moved massive vertical movements of the earth's crust it reshaped the earth nearly every part of the planet and so we're talking about survivors of that great catastrophe uh, there's some wonderful folklore in Richard Firestone's book of uh, how people survived the great catastrophe um, and these are the legends which lead to the great flood in the Bible, etc. Um, and so we've got um, very, very 
obvious evidence that um, these people had survived that catastrophe. Now that catastrophe was caused by, um, and Firestone deals with it well, a supernova explosion which went off something like 49,000 BC. So we had an incredibly unstable period of time between 49,000 BC and 9,400 BC when normal life could continue again on this planet. Now, the people who started agriculture had incredible knowledge of uh, seeds and plants. And they must have brought the seeds with them or certainly the knowledge with them. And then we have a lot of stories about Noah's Ark or Manu's cache of seeds and many other folklore stories to give us the clues. In fact, there's a cache of seeds in Norway in case the same thing happens again now so that we've got our cache of seeds so we can start again if we have the same kind of wipeout. So yeah. it's so important for people to look at the big picture. Um, if you look at Learning from History Part 1 on YouTube, you see I deal with the climate change issues and the Richard Firestone work. Um, and you'll see how important it is to be able to look at that big picture and see how fragile our environment on this planet actually is. Uh, the planet's been absolutely brilliant at looking after itself for millions of years to get us this far. But it's had to go through the most appalling times, which have had great impacts on all species, including man. There is no real evidence to suggest that the Anunnaki were aliens. All the evidence points to the fact that they were very tall, um, fair-skinned. Um, they were very sensitive to ultraviolet light. Um, when Enoch met them, he was terrified because they ha were wearing reflagnant or reflective uh, white paint um, or paste on their faces. Um, but when he was clothed and washed and taken to meet the great Lord, he said, I look just like one of them, and all my fear and trembling left me. And so when the Earth's atmosphere, maybe a third or more, was stripped off at that great catastrophe, 10,850, then the planet would have been bathed in ultraviolet right. Anybody, uh, any, any species, um, that had survived the great catastrophe would have been much more sensitive, particularly if they had no hair. Uh, uh, they would have been more sensitive to that ultraviolet light, hence the uh, shining ones uh, or, or the faces or um, um, the, uh, the reflection of the faces, which got scrambled like so many other words. Uh, these were called wise people, wise men, wise women, and the word for wise women um, was serpent. Uh, they weren't snakes at all, and that's another great big red herring which people still hang on to today, thinking they were reptilians and serpents, etc., which is complete nonsense. Okay, all right. Now, from what I can understand, there, there, there were two events near the end of the Ice Age, the first one causing the Younger Dryas, and the second one ending the Ice Age. If it, it, can it really be called an Ice Age if it shifted on its axis? Uh, was it just a shift in where the poles were? Well, you're quite right. That with the, the Firestone work makes the point that the North Pole um, was at the point of the Hudson Bay. And so the Hudson Bay was the North Pole. And when the Earth's axis was shifted by about 14, 15 degrees, then the North um, pole moved to where it is now. There may have been small shifts ever since, but though that, that was the major movement. And, and so the pole shift had a, had a very dramatic effect on North America and, of course, all, all parts of the world, which has to be taken into account here. Um, the, um, the general conditions up to the um, point in time where the last debris came smashing through our atmosphere, um, we then suddenly get a flattening of the graph of the swings in temperature. From 49,000 BC to 9,400, we've got very 
violent swings in the Earth's temperature. And then for whatever reason, whether it was another event or not, we have a stabilization of the swings in temperature on this planet at 9,400 or round about that time. And we do get a very rapid warming. So some people feel there was another event which brought the end of the Younger Dryas Ice Age and gave us that warming period which allowed man to start farming again. But many people doubt that farming would have been possible um, um, during the period from 49,000 BC to 9,400 BC. It may have been possible, and we're told from the Egyptian sources that the area of the Azores uh, would have been a place where farming may have been continued, and there may well have been other places on the planet where farming may have been possible. But clearly there was a much, much smaller population, um, and the, the major event is the um, sudden arrival of Cro-Magnum man at about this 50,000 BC boundary. Uh, but that takes us into anthropology and another subject. So we all on the planet, every single one of us uh, on the male uh, M158 marker can trace our ancestry back to a single male at around 50,000 BC. On the female mitochondria, we can track back to about 150,000 BC. So Eve was much earlier than Adam, as some people have said. <laughs> um, and I hope we'll find out a lot more. We are. The pace at which we are learning about our past uh, is accelerating. And the more we keep our minds open and, and don't get locked into this um, programmed uh, education we have, which is very slow to change and move, because all the history books have to be rewritten, which is a major problem for the historians. <laughs> well, yeah. um, we've got to keep an open mind and use our modern technology to understand who we are, where we came from, and how we're supposed to run things. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the Electric Universe earlier, and uh, I've had at least two guests on, uh, Wallace Thornhill and uh, Robert Schock, who suggest a more electrical event at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, Wallace, I believe, accounted it to uh, Venus making a close approach to the planet and Robert Schock to a, an outburst from the sun. Any thoughts on that? Well, Walter Thornhill I've met and I heard him speak, um, major influence on my life, wonderful man, and the Electric Universe project is very, very important. There are lots and lots of um, videos you can look at there which will broaden your mind on the whole issue of climate change, for example, um, and how the planet works and all the external factors that drive this planet and the ludicrousness of the idea that man can somehow influence the climate on the planet. It's complete and utter nonsense. And uh, in, in just passing on that, there's a big issue now because the European Union is going to spend 200 billion pounds each year on trying to reduce carbon emissions. It is a complete waste of money and it threatens about 1.7 million jobs just in the UK alone. The sooner we can drop this nonsense, the better. It's completely and utterly mad. Well, isn't it true, though, that, I mean, when you think about it, everything has an effect? Um, if you look at the natural sources of CO2 from volcanoes, from, from vegetation, from all the other factors, uh, man's influence is absolutely tiny. And in fact, CO, CO2 is something the planet requires. The satellite images of the Earth show that increases in CO2 have increased the green covering of the planet, which is what CO2 does. It's the heaviest of the greenhouse gases, or virtually the heaviest of the greenhouse gases. So it hangs around near the ground anyway, where the plants can access it. Um, ah, okay. Very important. And all the experts, the specialists in these subjects, were completely overridden by the independent panel for climate change who have produced so much untruthful material. Um, this has turned into an international fraud on a massive scale. And 
the amount of money we're wasting uh, on that false information threatens the planet more than almost anything else at the moment. We have countries around the world now in a deflationary phase and we're heading uh, to situations where people will be fighting one another for resources if we don't get our act together. That's how I see the situation from my work and I started on this in 2007 and you can see my uh, explanation of climate change on learning from history part one. It's based on uh, Hans Fenmark and Nigel Calder's book, The Chilling Stars. Uh, that science was confirmed in September of last year by um, Hans Fenmark in Denmark uh, and also confirmed by CERN in Switzerland. So the whole climate change argument has been disproved by brilliant scientists, but it's so big, it's so corrupt, so out of control that the people have not been given the truth. All right. Well, uh, let, let, let's go back to the, the possibility of an electrical discharge of some sorts causing the, the very end of the Ice Age, maybe knocking the planet off its axis. Do you think that's possible? It takes a tremendous amount of torque to um, anything tipping the Earth on its axis. And the belief was that um, Venus uh, traveling close to the Earth was the most likely reason for the Earth being tipped on its planet by 14 degrees. Venus uh, moving and all the planets moving out of line was a feature of the 10,850 cataclysm. Okay. Venus was not part of the cataclysm at 9,000 or whatever happened at 9,500. It is likely that 9,500 was the last we saw of influences which could keep the planet frozen um, and allow the planet to warm up. And I'm open to any research, and I'd love to see any research, which gives us the reason for the rapid warming of the planet. We know the natural cycles uh, on this planet put us into very cold weather very quickly. And for the same reason, it probably puts us into very warm weather very quickly. And those cycles are where we are traveling within the Milky Way system. Now back to Hans Fensmark's um, original uh, work on this subject. Okay. Um, so you're saying Venus was involved in the Younger Dryas event or the ending of the Younger Dryas event? It could not have been involved in the ending of the Younger Dryas event. Okay. It was involved in the Earth tipping on its axis because we had to have a very large object coming close to the Earth to tip the Earth on its axis. That required torque. Um, that's what... Um, the engineers called torque, and it required a large, very large object coming close. And this was at a time when there was massive disruption of planets in our universe, where the asteroid belt was a previously a solid object, smashed to pieces by whatever came through. This is very well described in Cataclysm by Alan and Dallaire and mirrors, in fact, what the Sumerians wrote about this period of time. Because there's clear evidence that the Sumerians knew exactly what happened, and that the Great Pyramid encodes this unbelievable event. So that How so? people who built the Great Pyramid, uh, who produced something we couldn't replicate today, brilliant mathematics, that knowledge carried through to allow the Great Pyramid to be built, to warn us of what happened then. And the spate of pyramid building on the Giza Plateau to prepare for what they thought was going to be another similar event. So all those pyramids and all the structures around the world being built at that time were because they thought another great catastrophe was coming. And it did at 2,300 and 55 BC, but it wasn't as bad as the previous ones. So, so what, what happened then? Well, we get a similar, uh, um, you get massive explosions right the way across from 
southern Europe right the way through Samaria across to India and China at that date. A massive disruption and the final end of the city-state system uh, in the area of the, the Hittites, Sumer, uh, right the, through the Indus Valley, etc., etc. And so that was, a, that was a, a, a really big one, and they knew it was coming. For example, the sites in England, which were straightforward observatories, many of them were converted into um, massive shelters. Um, Stonehenge, for example, um, was an open observatory, may well have had lots of uh, timber buildings with roofs, but certainly the building of Stonehenge was an intention of having a very substantial roof as the Etruscan people were building around about the same time. We find those great structures. Uh, you wouldn't have engineered Stonehenge in the way it is built um, with mortars and tenon joints and lintels if you weren't going to put a massive timber and earth roof on top. Mm. Our problem is we look at things as they are and can't, don't have the vision to work out what they were designed for. It's much easier for somebody who's been an architect or a building surveyor to see uh, that we're looking at the stamps of what would have been a fantastic structure, probably with a lot of accommodation in that wooden roof. Well, yeah, I would think so. Um, now, you said the, the 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 last disaster was encoded into the Great Pyramid. How was that done? The um, star shafts are very, very important. The King's Chamber star shafts. If you follow the line of the King's Chamber star shafts, you find they point to where the North and South Pole stars were when the pyramid was built around about two and a half thousand BC. The Queen's Chamber star shafts point to where the South and North Pole stars were before the Earth was tipped on its axis. Okay. To do that, you, you had to have detailed records and astronomical knowledge going back to before the time the Earth was tipped on its axis. And that's what we're finding when we, we see and find an advanced civilization has survived and starts again at 9,400 at what is called the pre-pottery Neolithic A and pre-pottery Neolithic B boundary. Do you think that uh, the alignment of the pyramids is to the belt stars in Orion? Um, the, um, the, the key... The key um, the, 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 I'm, I'm just trying to recall the names of the stars, but we're talking about Alpha Draconis as being the South Pole star, um, and I think Alpha Draconis is, with, is in with is in the Orion uh, the Orion um, structure. So we've got to look. We, if we look closely at, where, at this North North and South Pole star, which is crucial for aligning. A building anyway. You probably right. realize the Great Pyramid is aligned, and all pyramids were aligned very precisely, east, north, south, west. If we look at a much earlier Sphinx, we find that is aligned very accurately due east. Well, that puts clever people back another two or three thousand years. And so we've got lots of evidence of an advanced civilization leaving messages for us about the dangers of um, uh, uh, impacts on our planet or factors which can destroy our planet, like supernova explosions. And, and I'm told there have been 10 minor supernova explosions which have impacted upon the Earth in the last 10,000 years. So it, it's, this is the area of research that we're all getting more involved in and beginning to understand better. But I think the Richard Fastone work is of immense importance, uh, and in particular, um, Derek Allen and, and Bernard Delaire's work, Cataclysm. And Bernard Delaire will soon be bringing out a new, updated version of that, which is going to be um, a brilliant book to get when it comes out. I hope it won't be more than another six months. Okay. Um, well, we're almost out of time for right now. 
Uh, I would definitely want to have you back soon to continue this as we've just scratched the surface here. Um, where can people find stuff that you're doing? What's the website? The website is uh, www.goldenageproject.org.uk. And I, I can recommend they also look on, on YouTube for the Learning from History presentations. There'll be two more going up in the next three months, um, which will be um, uh, Learning from History uh, Parts 11, which is about Thomas, uh, Jesus' uh, twin brother. Um, there's um, currently Learning from History Part 12, um, and Learning from History Part 14 I've just recorded. Um, and so I'm building on these, and the more I do, the better the, better the information gets, obviously with the time <laughs> involved. Um, and the website hasn't been updated now for 15 years. It's had to suffice, I'm afraid. Uh, it will be eventually a, a major update um, it, over the next two years. But I hope people will be patient. And But I think nearly all the information there, there's very little that I would change. A lot of it I can improve, and I will improve it. But um, you know, get in touch through the Golden Age Project website have a look at the learning from histories. There's lots there. You don't have to take it all at one go. Just take it in small bites or listen to the um, sound, which you can do on D-Program Radiocom. Um, and um, make your own mind up. This is for you to make your minds up and uh, to add to the evidence. This is something we all need to work on. And, and the learning from history series is absolutely fantastic. Um, if people want to, do you still have copies of the Shining Ones on the website? Um, yes, the Shining Ones are very much available. Um, I'm saying to people now that we haven't got the genius of the few for the moment, but really the Shining Ones, by the time I've posted it around the world, it's costing me nearly £14. And so you're getting three or four books um, for £36, which is pretty cheap for a quality <laughs> hardback, rolling all the most valuable scientific in information or historic information into one publication. And that's something that only somebody like Christian Brown could have done. Uh, the Path of Light is available for those of you who want to really look at that side of things and to follow me on this path in discovering who Jesus was, what he was teaching, and how he was in fact um, King of the Druids. Um, as somebody's described it, there is a wonderful book called Jesus King of the Druids. Um, we're all beginning to realize that uh, we have a history outside Christianity and that Christianity was in fact a restatement of Druid beliefs and not an organized religion as such. Okay, and uh, are, are you working on a book as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm putting together, um, and I've got it pretty well drafted, um, the story of Jesus for a film. Um, and but it's it's uh, it's got to be good. <laughs> yeah, it may take me another six months or more. But um, w with a bit of help, we may be able to get some people working on it. We're also trying to do uh, exactly the same thing with our British Constitution um, or the English Constitution of 1688 to 89, on which the American Constitution is based. And we need to tell that story very, very clearly because his, this is how we broke out of a very dangerous religious straitjacket uh, to allow people to practice whatever they wanted to practice in freedom uh, from that time. And it was this whole question of a balance between the power of the crown uh, in our country, the lords, and the commons. That balance of power in running a country was absolutely crucial. We've completely destroyed it now, passed all the powers to our House of Commons, and they've passed it all to the European Union. So no wonder <laughs> we're all in such a terrible mess. Now, did you say you're, you're, you're working on a movie script for this, for the uh, Jesus one? The, the Jesus one, I'm working on uh, um, a movie script. Uh, okay. And uh, that will be um, uh, following Jesus um, from his birth, uh, from his link to the royal families in Britain, Rome, and Judea, um, and following him on to um, his journeys when he left Rome about 49 
49 AD. He was untenable to continue living in Rome. And Thomas had already, um, um, I was on the way to India then, Thomas founded the first Christian church at Kerala in India in AD 58. And Jesus followed on. And then we actually have the first churches at Glaston at, 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 and Lanedin in Wales in AD 63, Glastonbury AD 64. So Jesus and Thomas led the way. They were teaching Druidism. Um, and they made tremendous progress in India because Buddhism was based on Druidism. All the religions of the world are based on Druidism. And that's hmm. why they were so successful. And that's why we have a fantastic story to tell to bring peace to the world and bring people together and to actually follow the concept of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, are you, are you doing this as a documentary or as a story format? Um, I'm just listing all the key details and points and subjects. And if anybody wants to come along and uh, help with the funding um, of getting this story out, please let me know. Um, I want to maintain as much editorial control as possible for obvious reasons. Right. But all the thoughts, ideas, history is there. A lot more needs to be added. And if it's going to be done, it needs to be done properly. Otherwise, it'll disappear without a trace like so many other stories have done. Oh. This is a story we want to stick in every country in the world. All right. Well, I thank you for talking with us tonight. We'll have you back soon. And uh, one more time, the website? GoldenAgeProject.org.uk. All right. Thanks, Edmund.